Um, hello and uh, welcome everyone to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. And we're actually welcoming three audiences tonight. Uh, most happily, we've got a big in-person audience and um, that's really exciting because this is the first time we've ever done this event and um, you've nearly filled every seat. So thank you all for being here. The second audience. <laughs> The second audience is uh, watching online live. So this uh, program is streaming live on our YouTube channel, uh, which means that everybody here can watch it again later if you want. And um, the third audience is the future audience who will be able to watch this program at some point from anywhere in the world in the future. So all of you, welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Perry. I'm the museum's executive director. And it's really nice to not be responsible for this program like I am so many others. That responsibility falls to a wonderful woman I'm about to introduce. Um, we Are Waltham is an extraordinary community event that has been in the visioning phase for quite some time, starting in the early days of COVID. Um, Chandra Lahiri, who uh, is responsible for uh, the vision and the organization of this event, um, she and I have been talking about doing something like this for quite some time. She has been doing a program uh, also in Waltham called Voices, uh, which has been a multilingual program, as I understand it. And um, anyway, for We Are Waltham, this is the first one in what we envision to be an ongoing series, that we would do uh, uh, an event like this or a show like this once every season. Um, you can see what the problem is with summer season. Um, we can't turn out the lights yet. Uh, the sun is up too late, too long, but, um, and this room has so many skylights and windows that you know, the lighting is a little funny. You're gonna notice that more online than everyone here. Um, in any event, I wanna introduce to you now Chandra Lahiri, who is a dynamic uh, leadership presence in Waltham, and I've really enjoyed the process of working with her to get to this day. It has been a journey. Um, anyway, you ready? This is your night. Wow. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'm super nervous. Those of you who know me, I talk everyone's head off. I'm not usually nervous. But like Bob said, this has been stewing for so long. It just has taken on a lot of weight to me. So excuse me, I'm going to use flashcards for the first time in my life um, to make sure <laughs> that I don't talk your ears off. Um, all right. So first of all, thank you, Bob for your support and for being patient with me as we incubated and incubated this thing. It's like a dinosaur egg that refused to hatch, but then it did. Um, Waltham Cultural Council, thank you for a grant that we co-wrote and we got funding um, and for this beautiful space that we're able to do this in. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. My husband, Shovik, and I came to Waltham about 14 years ago when our son was two years old. And it is now home. We were in search of a community and we found one. Um, and we've loved Waltham. And we, I've, the thing that's blown me away is the diversity. And by diversity, I just don't mean what you think I mean. It's a diversity of ideologies, of orientations, of ethnicities, of culture, of music, of language. We've got it all going on here, bubbling like a little wonderful multi-layered stew. And I've also really loved the spirit of community. Um, it's kind of what Shovik and I were looking for when we moved, where people roll up their sleeves and they give back to the community, and that's here in spades. Now, my day job is, has got nothing to do with this. I work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Do not complain to me about the dam. I've got nothing to do with that. I make maps for them. Um, but in my spare time, I write and I do storytelling. And what I have learned from storytelling is that it's an amazing way to bridge chasms and divides that naturally occur, right? There's so many different Walthams in this one Waltham. There's so many different cities in every city. And when you don't, when you don't have the exact same experience as someone else, sometimes we jump to conclusions. Sometimes we st slap labels on people and indulge in stereotypes. And what I've found through the wonderful art of storytelling, which is sharing real stories in the first person, is that it's hard to be suspicious or mistrustful of someone who feels like an other 
if you can relate to their story. It's, it's hard to feel that someone is foreign or a culture is strange if you know a little bit about that culture. And how on earth are we supposed to do that in this one lifetime we have and in the 24 hours that is given to us through storytelling? And so that's why I was really eager to bring a show to Waltham where we can empathize and laugh with the tellers, cry for them, and in doing so, close the distances that naturally exist between people in any society. And if we start to see that we agree on more that we than we disagree, then I think that's what makes us all together one Waltham, and not one Waltham, that's a different brand and a tag. That's what makes us say we are Waltham. So that's my little uh, spiel, and that's my reason why I wanted to do this. And I want to thank you ahead of time for opening your hearts and your minds to the tellers that we're going to bring to you today. A lot of them are first-time storytellers. They are not polished. They're just taking this immensely courageous step of opening up their lives and their hearts to you. And I know you'll join me in telling them that we're all supporting them. We're all here to bear witness, to support them, to take what they're giving us. Um, these are all going to be positive personal stories. This is not a place for hate, and this is not a place for intolerance. We're building community. We're growing together. So onto the agenda. What tonight's going to look like is we have six tellers in total. We're going to do three tellers first, telling stories, uh, eight to ten minutes each. Then we're going to go for a little ten-minute break, during which we're going to have local Waltham musicians playing some tunes while we stretch our legs or... <laughs> So applaud or process what we've heard. After that, we're going to have three more tellers. And then my important PSA is that there's going to be an open mic. Now, the open mic isn't for poetry and essays. It's still for storytelling. But as you listen to these first three tellers, think. Do you have a personal story from your life, preferably connected to Waltham, but it doesn't have to be, that you'd like to share? If you think you have one, if it's a story, if it doesn't have hate or intolerance, and you think you want to just get up and give this a shot, no one's judging you. There are slips in a little green box at the bottom of the podium here. Fill one out, put it in the hat, and right at the end, we're going to draw out a couple of slips, and time permitting, we'll take as many tellers as they'd like. Six-minute stories. Um, so I think that's it for now. Yeah, with that, we are going to bring on our first storyteller. And of course, I forgot to get my cards. Would you mind? Thank you so much. All right, our first teller is a person who just handed me my card, David LeBlanc. David, would you like to step up to the stage while I introduce you? Let's give it up for David. So I asked my tellers to give me a one or two line bio. This is what David sent me. David describes himself as a Spanish speaking gringo and a descendant of the Penobscot, a Native American tribe in Maine. He's a licensed social worker, and he works in student support services at the Waltham Partnership for Youth. And I do want to give everybody trigger warnings when they're uh, necessary. David's story does touch on mental health and suicide. So if anybody has to take any steps, if this is too much for you, we'll give a five-second beat before you start. Um, and enjoy. Thank you, David. You, you have to press the button to engage. It was 2016 when I first seriously thought of ending my life. I had just moved to Portland, Maine after living almost my entire life in the state of Massachusetts. And I was going there for obtaining my master's in social work. And I was able to go to this public school through a program that supported descendants of Native Americans. And I am, along with being a very white Spanish-speaking gringo, I am Penobscot on my mom's side. My mom is an enrolled member of the Penobscot Nation, a tribe in Maine. And family was very, very important to me. I grew up homeschooled with five brothers. Shout out to my mom and dad, God bless them, because they sure needed many blessings raising us six boys. 
Shout out to my five brothers, Jake, Zach, John, Josh, and Nate. And family was everything to me. We did homework together, we fought together, played sports together. I helped chop fruits and veggies for lunch and dinner. We got into trouble and messes together and apart. And I was never very apart from my family for a very long time outside of a study abroad experience in southern Mexico for four months. And even that, I lived with a host family. During my college years, I just walked across the street to my undergrad where I studied Hispanic studies and, and learned to speak Spanish. And then I would walk back and I'd have my own bedroom with one of my brothers. And it wasn't until I moved to Portland, Maine, in my excitement of leaving my family behind and becoming independent and adulting for the first time, I didn't take into account that I would not be eating home-cooked meals, I would not be sleeping in my own bed, I would not be able to converse and hang out with my brothers anytime I wanted. And that was a big deal. On top of that, I came in with such a huge burden of imposter syndrome, I wasn't smart enough, to go to grad school. I didn't think I could be successful there. And I had grown up always trying to do my best at absolutely everything. Uh, my brothers referred to me as the golden child. Uh, oh, you're, you're the perfect one. I tried to be the rule follower. And I tried to do what was right and not let anyone down and not quit and not let myself down. And with grad school comes a lot of pressures. All of a sudden, I am taking extra amounts of notes, writing papers, I'm studying my butt off, I'm staying up way too late and not sleeping enough. I started to share a, a bedroom with a complete stranger, and I'm like, what, what are you doing here? You're not my brother, like, get out of my room. Like, no, I actually have to uh, live with this person. That's okay, this is called real life, this is adulting. Cafeteria food was fine, and it wasn't mom's cooking. And slowly but surely, things started to snowball where isolation, uh, feelings of depression and anxiety and this immense weight I had put on myself of I have to succeed, I have to do well, and I can't quit started to mount. I was driving home from one of the campuses one night. It was, it was, it was dark, and I can't remember if I was on the highway or if I was on one of the back roads, and I was driving pretty fast. And, and an overwhelming sense of needing to escape my feelings of depression and anxiety started to mount. I felt I just needed these feelings and these thoughts to stop. And I also thought, like, what is wrong with me? I'm going to grad school. Things are going pretty well for me. Why am I thinking this way and feeling these things? So there's an additional layer of guilt and, and self-blame. And all I could think of was, I need to escape. I just want these feelings and these thoughts to stop. I don't want to feel this way. I just want this to be over with. And in my head, it wasn't as simple as, well, I'm just going to drive home. Because then I'd have to explain to family and parents and other people, like, oh, well, why are you home? Like, what's wrong? What's going on? I also didn't want to take a break. I didn't know I could take a break from grad school. I would be quitting and I'd be letting other people down and disappointing them and disappointing myself. And in my head, all I could think of is, well, but this has to end somehow. And I remember driving very fast down the road and I started looking at the guardrail and I was thinking to myself, I could crash my car. I could just veer into the guardrail and I could end my life. Or maybe I would put myself in the hospital and then that way I didn't have to go to classes and maybe my family would come and take care of me and everything would be okay and I wouldn't have been a quitter. It just, it just happened. And, and I grew up in, in a faith background and, and I'm Christian and having a friendship with Jesus is something very near and dear to my heart. And I didn't see any help coming for me or any peace. And I just wanted to leave these thoughts and these feelings behind whatever way possible. 
and so I started to drift towards the guardrail. And I'm not sure if it was someone, if it was something, and I was able to snap back the wheel and, and continue driving. And I had tears in my eyes and I was so scared at what could have happened. And somehow I was able to make it back to my dorm room. I arrived safely. I told my then girlfriend what had happened and she encouraged me to seek help. And so for the first time in my life, after thinking I had to keep things bottled up, I, I went to therapy. And I've been in therapy for the past six years and the past four years with the same therapist. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And I think it was one of the things that did save my life. And that has been coupled with sharing my story and medication and going for walks and prayer in community. And that really informed my career. I graduated with a master's in social work. I moved back to Massachusetts. I worked in children's mental health. And two months ago, I actually started a new job at Waltham Partnership for Youth, a place that I love a lot and some of you may know. And I got back into working with, with kiddos and, and, and mental health, whether in explicit or implicit ways. And recently, this just happened a couple weeks ago. We had a health fair at a local middle school. And my colleague and I were helping make stress balls for the kids. And we were asking the kids to write down on post-it notes anything that they wish adults or teachers in their middle school should know about them. What is something that you wish adults or teachers knew about you? And some of the kids wrote down, I like pizza. I want better food in the cafeteria. I want school to start later. I want more time for homework in class. I wish we talked more about mental health. And I wish we had more counselors in school. And I was able to converse with students. And in this one student, as, as we were conversing in Spanish, I asked them, what would you like people to know about you? What is something that you wish adults knew about you? And in Spanish, she said, quiero morir, I want to die. And as soon as she said that, her eyes got really big and she put her hands in front of her mouth and she just kind of froze looking at me and I wonder if it was she said that out loud and also I forgot that this white, pacey looking gringo speaks Spanish. And I also froze. And whether subconsciously or not, there was a flashback. I've been there. I know what it feels like to want to die. There was that time in the car with the guardrail at night. And how I responded to her was, eso es válido, that's valid. That is valid. And she looked at me and she said, really? It's like, yeah. Sometimes we have those thoughts and feelings. She looked thoughtful. I asked her, do you have a trusted adult, maybe a teacher that you could talk to? She shook her head no. I asked, was there perhaps someone at home, a family member? And she shook her head and said, yo no tengo a nadie. I don't have anyone. And she walked away. And I didn't know what to do, and I froze again. I took a breath, and I turned to my colleague, explained the situation. My colleague was able to speak with the student, get them connected to a teacher, get them connected to a counselor. I don't know the rest of her story. We'll call her Lucia. And I hope that she's able to confide in people that care about her to get the support that she needs and one day be able to help someone else in a time of need. And I hope that one day Lucia will be able to tell her own story in her own words. Thank you very much.
Thank you, David. That was not easy to tell, but uh, our next teller with another wonderful story for you to enjoy is Ash Abrams. Ash, you want to come up Ooh. while I introduce you? <laughs> you can unmask. Yeah. <laughs> Ash is an educator for elementary school and an art specialist who focuses on painting and photography. And she's going to take us away on another journey. Thank you so much. Everyone give it up for Ash. It's a little too tall for me, so. All right, welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Everyone's coming of age story and everyone's coming out story varies differently. I was lucky enough to have mine bloom right here in Waltham. But first, let's take it back to my creaky old four-bedroom apartment on Brayton Road. Three 20-something-year-olds, me, and two of the most affectionate kitties. I felt stable. You know, I was living with my best friend. I had a job that paid the bills. And I had a boyfriend. See, in my late 20s, you know, the fantasy of a heteronormative lifestyle is the goal. Marriage, family, house, and a hyperallergenic dog in the backyard. I felt that things were good until things came to a screeching hold, March 2020, a global pandemic. Change was inevitable. Masks, emergency, quarantining, and I had no car. No car to see my boyfriend. <laughs> so what did I do? Well, anyone who had this fantasy in the stream would have done. I put all my stuff into a suitcase and I moved into my boyfriend's family home with four other adults and two dogs. At the time, it seemed normal. It seemed like a good idea. So yeah, I didn't have a job, but I had his family and his world. I got to learn ASL from his deaf of hearing sister, who was incredible. I got to paint murals on his house with his mother, who was stunning. And then I finally came up with the courage one day, a hot summer day by the pool. I looked into his deep ocean eyes and I said, we should move in together. And he complied. <laughs> so we started looking places until we finally found a affordable listing right here in Waltham. Things seemed good. So with a wave of an Edison brand pen, we became Waltham residents, August 2020. Yay! <laughs> Things were great. At least that's what I thought. I was excited to finally put decor up on our walls really showed who we were and our authenticity. So me, of course, I'm putting a BLM and queer paraphernalia all over the apartment, creating a space that was comfortable, a space that was home. And then I noticed a shift. Boyfriend was not as comfortable as and excited as I was. Barely any of the decor reflecting who he was, there was a shift in our relationship. But instead of paying it any mind, I pressed it under the rug, as many people do in serious relationships, because things, things seemed good. Come fall, I got a job, a teaching job and I met her. So I bet you're wondering, 
Ash, is this a romantic relationship? No, she was my friend. A queer POC educator, a mentor, and someone I looked up to, even though she was only 22 years old. After a long week, long school week, she handed me a book, not knowing that it would change my life forever. Queer, a graphic history. Her name on the right side corner. I read this book in under 30 minutes. I'm not a big book reader, see? I don't read books, but this one sang a song that only my heart could hear. Each illustration, paragraph, page, it made me feel feelings I could not put into words. And I cried. Under my sheets, my blankets, buried, I cried, I wallowed. My awakening, it's here. But I try not to be as loud to alert boyfriend laying on the couch, just a thin wall away. I felt seen, I felt whole, but the moments I put my hands above those sheets and bring myself out of that bed, I became raw. I felt sick. I was terrified. But I knew I needed to tell my partner. I needed them to know about this awakening. So I go into the living room. I reach out my hand. I look at him and I say, this is the book. He looks at me, and in reply, he says, that's cool, I'll read it tomorrow. I was so ill. It was as if he had took my identity and he slapped it out of my body right onto the cold floor. That tomorrow, became next week, and that next week never came. And that heteronormative fantasy never came true. But thank goodness, though, because that summer, something magical truly happened. I went on my first date. <laughs> my first date with a gorgeous woman from her, which is a queer dating app. <laughs> And as we walked hand in hand down Moody Street with stars in our eyes, I noticed something. I looked down Moody Street about a million times since I've been living here for about a year. But then I finally saw it. This community has so much pride, the same pride that resides in me. And to be a resident, that felt good. So in June 2021, I came out to my family, my friends. And exactly one year later, I volunteered at Waltham's first Pride event. Change was happening. Shifting was happening. And today, I read, a end of the year letter from one of my students. And this is what it read. I support pride. I'm not sure what I like, boys or girls. I don't have any feelings. So I think I'm bi, spelled B-I-E. <laughs> You're the first one I told. I hope you support me. Wow. I was speechless. 
as tears run down my face and I hold this white crinkles computer printer paper with markers of rainbow color. I thought to myself, me being queer and me being outly queer, it's not just about me anymore. It's a warm hug. It's a friendly face. It's a mentor. It's a book handed to a tired coworker on a long week. It's a safe space. And this community, the LGBTQ plus community, has always shown me that they praise authenticity, that they celebrate diversity. And that's something that Waltham has also showed me. Waltham, you have shown me that you celebrate diversity, you praise authenticity, and you enjoy and let us be us. And with that, I thank you guys. People are taking my breath away. I wasn't ready for this. Needed a drink before this. Thank you so much. After, after, right. Thank you, Ash. I hope you all enjoyed that and uh, are recovering from it as you listen to our next teller. It's really hard for me to just go into the uh, teller after teller after hearing these amazing stories, but we're going to get a break after this next teller where we can think more and breathe and exhale into these stories. Our next teller is Gabrielle Garcino. Bob Bro. Bob Bro. <laughs> Bob is. <laughs> what? <laughs> we call her Gabby. All right, so I was told to stay near there to be in the good light. You want the good light? Yes. Gabby teaches Spanish in Belmont High School. So she's, Dave pointed out, she's also a, a Spanish speaking gringo. Yeah. Um, she loves company and that give and take of energy and perspectives and she's happiest when she's learning new things about people and I'm so pleased to have her share her story. Take it away Gabby. Give me a second. To yeah. Great crowd. Thanks everybody for being here. So I live on Dale Street in Waltham. I like to call it the easement to 128. I don't know if you know it, but it starts at Lexington Street and it ends at Prospect Hill. And if you're lucky enough to be turning onto Dale from Lexington and get a green light at Bacon Street, you could be going by my house at 60 miles an hour, <laughs> 70 miles an hour. Um, and one summer day, I happened to notice this green four-door sedan that really I've seen in lots of different parts of the city that never goes fast. And I noticed that the driver of the car, who we'll call Conrad, always had a, a, a white man with sort of curly blonde hair and a, always a hat on and the car would be stuffed with things like lamps, furniture, statues. Sometimes next to him in the back seat, sometimes on the top of the car, sometimes kind of spilling out of the, the back of the car. And um, I would occasionally wonder about this person. Well, one day it's summertime and my husband Steve and I are fussing around in the yard and throwing things out that we don't want anymore. So we're outside, and we have a bunch of junk on the curb there. And uh, along comes Conrad. And he slows down in front of our pile of stuff, and he turns into our driveway. And I'm standing right there, and I just sort of wave or whatever, and um, I said, you're welcome to come take a look, you know my garbage, your joy. <laughs> and um, 
He said, you know, what I'm really looking for is vinyl records. I said, funny you should say that. We are currently this summer on a mission to curate a bunch of different collections of vinyl records that we've acquired from different family and friends. Conrad puts the car in park, <laughs> leans closer in, and he says, can I see your records? And I paused and I thought, of course he could see my records, you know, maybe not right now. <laughs> we need to go through them, we need to decide which ones we want to keep, etc. I understand. I said, why don't you give me your contact information. So Conrad takes out a piece of paper, he writes down his number, he's handing it to me. And just as I'm about to say, hey, should I text you? He says, please use the phone. I can't do the email. <laughs> okay, great. Conrad drives off. So it's probably like four weeks later, something like that. And I haven't forgot about Conrad and trying to imagine him looking through my records. And I say, what the hell? So I call him up and I say, Conrad, my name's Gabrielle. I live on Dale Street in Waltham. I don't know if you remember me, we talked about vinyl records. He says, Gabrielle, I remember you well. <laughs> so Conrad comes over to 143 Dale Street and I invite him into my house. And we have one crate of records that we've set aside for him and he starts going through them one at a time, sort of pulling them half out of the crate and spilling all of this crazy information about artists and years and albums and recordings and whatever. And the guy knows a lot. So I'm curious, obviously I've invited him into my house. So I ask him a bunch of questions and I find out that Conrad and his colleague opened the first used record store in Massachusetts. And so I proceed to ask him more questions. He proceeds to go through more of the record albums, not really interested in any of them. And so I say, so what kind of music do you like to listen to? And he says, I don't, I don't really listen to music. <laughs> so I say, I'm sorry, but isn't that kind of ironic? He's like, well, I, I do really like Jamaican house music. I go down to Jamaica. Have you ever been to Jamaica? I say, no, but I've heard Jamaican house music. He said, so you know, you know, it's got these heavy beats. And Conrad, who's looking a little bit more spiffed up than the day that I saw him in his car, he's not wearing his hat, he's got this flowy Hawaiian shirt on, he starts to put up his hands and start <laughs> dancing in my living room. And I'm thinking, time has stopped right now. I'm feeling really exhilarated, really excited. But I'm also really grateful that my husband Steve is sitting here next to me. <laughs> my dog is here. I offer him a glass of water. And, you know, he's not interested in any of our records. It turns out he's interested in, like, 70s and 80s metal, because apparently he found some box of it up at some other pl neighborhood of the city and made a fortune. It's the hot stuff, right? So he, we don't have any of that, or maybe, Steve, you decided not to put it into the crate. <laughs> well, we kept it, but um, he exits shortly after that. And I've looked for the green car I've looked for Conrad around, around the way, as they say, and I haven't seen him. But if you see Conrad, even if he has a new car, and you have some Iron Maiden records, or you have some Metallica records, call him over. And then call me, because I'd really like to see him again. Thank you so much, Gabby. Uh, so in full, full disclosure, thank you.
David. Um, we had a soft release of this show last year at Riverfest, and Gabby told the story, and it was just so wonderful that I had to ask her to tell it again. Um, but yeah, with that, um, may I have that, please? Thank you. That is our third teller, and we are ready to take a break so we can all stretch our legs, visit the restroom, which is out that way, and over to the right. Um, but also, I would like to tell you that after this, we're going to have three more tellers, and then we'll be the open mic. So, if you have liked the stories that you've, t that you've heard, if you have some ideas bubbling for a story you might like to tell, then please come over here in the break. At the bottom by the podium is a, a green box with some slips in it. Fill out your name, your email, and whether or not you're a Waltham resident only, or whether you work in Waltham, only because we'll prioritize Waltham tellers over non-Waltham tellers. Um, and then you put it in the little hat. My husband's lent me his hat. And at the end, when the next three tellers are over, we will have somebody in the audience do a couple of random draws, and you guys will get to tell, you, tell your stories. So with that, also, I need to tell you that we, you pass me my cards, please. I'm just too carried away by the stories. Uh, the break will also be filled with beautiful music. I uh, encourage you to come back and take your seats to listen to some of it. Playing music for us will be Stephen, Steve Dobrow, uh, Bo Bobro, sorry, Bob Rowing about Bobro, and Lynn Matthews. Uh, a quick intro, Steve is an educator with a passion for music. He plays a bunch of instruments and these days has a close relationship with a trombone. Gabby does not mind, she's his wife. <laughs> he has played with community activist bands like School of Honk and Bab Babam, right? We also have Lynn Matthews, he's gonna be playing his close relationship with uh, the, the trombone. We have Lynn Matthews, who has also been very generous to give, her her, give us her time. She has resumed her musical journey as an adult, and she enjoys experimenting with various musical styles. Today, she's on the bass. So come on up here, and everyone come back quickly, fill out your slips, and listen to some good music. Ten minutes, we'll be back.
Hello, hello everyone. I hope you had a good break and this enjoyed the music. So we're going to resume. Coming up is our next teller, uh, Nila Desai. Nila, if you'd like to step up while I introduce you. Nila Desai, yep, give it up for her. Nila Desai is a beautician and a businesswoman. Now, I have to tell you, English is not Nila's first language, but she has been an incredible sport and she will be sharing her whole life story and you're gonna see, it's been some kind of a life. I, I had no idea um, and I think you're all going to like it as much as I did. Um, I wanna tell you that her salon is called Dreams Beauty Salon and Spa at 88 Willow Street. You should all go check it out. But take it away, Nila. Give me a few seconds and then. Hello? Yeah. I came 1997. I'm not sure it was high enough. Yeah, hi. I came 1997 from Gujarat, India. I came with uh, my two sons, little sons, um, beautician license, my husband, alcoholic and became green cups, obviously. So, and then we came on New Jersey first. We rented the apartment next day. We came out today, next day we rented the apartment. You don't have the money. I got $3,000 for someone borrow. And my husband's work in a rest restaurant and I work two miles far from back and forth. I take my kids with me, it's an Indian salon, so I don't have to be speaking English. So same language, uh, sounds good, I feel, but it's fear. I, I fear because anything happened, my husband can start drinking, what are we gonna do? One day, my husband's drinking, and then he beat me in the midnight, I take my both kids on the road. It's a snowing, midnight, mid 12 o'clock. So one guy say, oh, you cannot be stay outside. The police can come and my big coach, your husband, yeah, you both, everyone. So it's like, go inside and take care. So we go inside, sleep at night, and then next day, I go to the salon and I talk everything, whoever, Dilip Bhai Patel, salon owner, and tell my whole situation and they say, oh, this is not good to hear, but I suggest you, you can go to the motel job. So they have a, you guys in a one roof and then you don't have to be worry about the babysitting and everything. You take care of your husband also, you watch husband. So you can go to the water town. So we came on water town, super eight motel. So we started the work, he work in a front desk. He drinking, but he working. And um, I work in housekeeping job, and my kids, it's a problem. I take the younger 18 month, I take with me. It's hard, they don't allowing, but they say it's okay, it's fine. And then I 
called my mom's from the immigration. My came, my mom's came, and she take care of my younger son. My elder son is eight years old, so he gonna go to the school bus, and he go to the school. He, I have a fear because it's one day my husband can drink on the front desk. My owner say, okay, he can come out then on the road. We are having no house, no nothing, no job, no money, nothing. So I fear, but I hope and I try to do something my side. And the next neighbor, she's American, she's a, my second angel. First one is Dilip Bhai Patel, second one is angel. She say, oh, Nila, I'm talking, talking, and say, I am a beautician, I'm working in a salon. So I talk with her, say, well, how you get the license? So I can help you. And then I got the license. And I say, one day might be I can do more work my side. My husband not working, still we can stay in the one room somewhere. So I got the license. And after the motel job finished to, to an 2.30, then I, after I, might be I thinking I can do my beauty job after my got the license. So I go to the CVS on the water town. I saw my town home one client. And I said, hi, oh, this is Nila, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm fine. So you doing here also work? I said, yeah, I'm doing. So she came and she bring all the family members. So she came and she bring all the family member who were come to the, my salon in India all family members came, so I getting side money, but money is not important. But I have to be strong, stand on my leg so I can survive my whole kid and my husbands and my mother. If somebody can kick them out, but I am, I have a job. That's my goal. And then one day my motel owner, Arjun Bhai, find out I'm working in a, his home because they give the free resident less money, I don't have the babysitting, so I like it, so it's fine, it's okay. But he said, oh, you cannot be working my premises, beauty service. I said, oh, oh, this is another problem. And then he said, oh, you guys are gonna coming out in a month. I said, oh, I want to do the something smooth coming next, but again, I falling down. Then I, one person, Hansa Sa, she calls me for the service. And said, no, I cannot do here, but you can take your home in a car because I don't have a car at the time. So I can be, do your service. And I go over there and I'm crying. And I said, can you find out one apartment? Because I don't know anybody here. So I say, oh, my, my apartment is here. It's empty, you can take it. So I make it lease and one year, and then I'm so happy I go home and I talking to my husband and my moms. I said, wow, that's fine. So then Arjun presidized to Hansa Sah and her husband. I said, hey, can you uh, don't give it lease, break the lease? And I said, so Hansa said, no, I already lease one year, I cannot be loose. So then next day, at the same time, Hansa told me, okay, oh, Arjun tell me that. She gives me, but I feel in a six month, I say, oh, might be next year, she cannot be least me. Again, I have to be moved out somewhere. But at that time, I have so many clients, and I'm, I'm talking to everyone, and I'm like, but I said, no, I move here, move here. I don't have a money in a bank. I don't have a credit. I don't have anything, and I'm stupid brave decision, and I said, no, I want to buy the house. And I go bank, every bank, every bank, and I say, every bank say, no, no, you don't get loan, you don't get loan. One guy, said, the real estate person also say, hey, you don't get the loan. How you, how you gonna get loan? You don't have anything. But one person say, I get, take the credit to give the Nila's loan. And I got the loan, and I bought the, in 2000, 1997 I came, 2000 I bought the house in a Willow Street, Walden. And 
But I have more confidence that I do it. Whatever I want to do, babysitting, cooking, beauty salon job, any job I can do, but I can save my house, but nobody can kick me out from the roof. We have the roof. That's we want, that's it. So after that, I'm doing the beauty service in my home. One customer came and I say, hey, you cannot do, you have a license, but you cannot do the work in a home because you can go to the city hall, get the business, permission from home. And I said, oh, oh, again, another problems. <laughs> and then I, I do, I have a car, so my kids is independent, they go to the school, buy privately, everything, and so I say, okay. And my mom's with me all the time. I see, take care of my kids and everything. I go every house to house and I make the money. Then I say, okay, I wanna do again bank. Can you give me the home equity loan? So I can, yeah, you can get it. So I get the home equity loan. I bought the salon in Harvard Square. <laughs> then that was the tenin salon. So I don't want, I'm not gonna fearing to my husband get the job and fire, job and fire. But I say, okay, I buy the tenin salon. So my husband can sit down with me and I can do the, my beauty job. So I can watch him and go back to home, get together, so it's fine. But suddenly he passed away in 2006. And whole situation come to me, but my kids is independent, they know the situation. My one son is a pilot, the other son is a professional baseball player. My mom's with me, 90 months, it is. 65 to until 100 years. So she passed away last year, long life. I miss her, but this is the, we cannot be carry my mom's here. But she lives long life, 100 years. I'm happy for that. And I'm a successful businesswoman. And my kids is very nice, studies and everything. So hopefully, I pushed down so many times, but I hope and faith, hope and faith, and I make it. So right now, I'm a successful woman. That's, I say. <laughs> Thank you. One more round of applause for Neela. And this is community. Thank you for sharing your story. So hard to move on from these. I even forgot to give you the trigger warning about domestic violence, but oh, thank you so much. Um, our next teller, Rachel Parzivand. Rachel, come on up while I tell people about you. Rachel works with middle school kids who have reading disabilities in Wellesley. She lives here. She likes to help out, create community, and she won't say this, but I will. She's the backbone of an organization called Waltham Mutual Aid, a group that supports disadvantaged Waltham families, and we owe her a lot. She's, she's a pretty staunch pillar of this community. Thank you, Rachel. Give me a couple of beats. Thank you. Uh -oh. I will not unhook the mic, but I, I might make it smaller. <laughs> okay, so it was like a week and a half into the pandemic, and I live in a one-bedroom apartment with my black cat, Sammy, and we were trying to go for a change of scenery, so I was on the floor. And I had my phone and I was doom scrolling, you know, COVID, wash your vegetables, don't touch anyone, don't breathe. And I got 
to a post about Waltham Mutual Aid. And I was like, all right, what's this? And I read the mission statement and it was like, help your neighbors, you know, join together, band up. And, you know, I love fixing a thing. If I can fix a problem, I feel so satisfied. And I was like, ooh, this is right up my alley. I'm gonna fix some stuff. And I, you know, put my name in and I got my assignment and it was to go get some groceries for an elderly neighbor uh, who could not go to the groceries themselves. And I was like, well, I, I probably won't die. I'm very young um, <laughs> at the time. And I had my assignment, so I go to the grocery store and I get all of the groceries and I call the person, and we're gonna use the name Margaret, I call Margaret, and I get no answer, and I was like, that's okay, you know, maybe she can't get to the phone in time. I call again, still no answer, but it's only about a mile from my house, so I have these groceries, and I walk over, and I have the apartment number, and it's one of those homes that has like a, it's built around a courtyard, which I never understand why we do here, because it's like cold, and you can't use it for like 90% of the year, um, but it's one of those like very confusing buildings where you can kind of get inside the building, but only on one side, and then there's this interior part, and you know, I kind of knocked around and, and someone kindly let me in. So I go and I leave the groceries by like apartment A1 by the door, and I try to give another call and I still don't have an answer, but I leave like this really like, you know, upbeat message like, I'm so glad I could help, here's your food, you know, let me know if you need any more help during this uh, troubling time, like I'm here for you feeling very good about what I did. I fixed a problem. And I'm about mm, half a mile away when my phone rings and I think, oh man, yeah, this is like, she's gonna call me and say thank you, it's gonna be great, we're gonna like maybe become best friends and learn to crochet. Um, <laughs> so I pick up the phone and on the phone, I just hear a very irate, angry woman. She says, you're going to give me a stroke. And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, what? <laughs> You're going to give me a stroke. I cannot find the food. And I, and I read the address to her and I said, well, I left it at this address at this door. Is that your, yes, and it's not at the door. And I was like, well, did you check your other door? It might be in the interior door or the exterior door. I only have one door. And I was like, well, I live in apartments and I know about egresses and how you have to have two. Um, so she says, you have to come back here and fix this problem. You're supposed to be helping. This isn't helping. And I was like, oh man, all right, okay, fine. I walk back and she is like on the phone with me telling me about how I'm giving her a stroke and I thought I was just giving her some juice, but that's okay. I get there and I knock on the door again and like these three kindly women all in their crone aspect come to the door and they can hear Margaret screaming at me from the phone and they're like, is that Margaret? And Margaret's on the line, don't tell people my business. And I'm like, you're telling people your business, you're very loud. Um, they tell me, oh, Margaret, she's upset, right? And I was like, yes, she says I didn't leave the food by her door. And they're kind of shouting over the phone, Margaret, you have two doors. Look at the other door. And she says, I do not have two doors. And she left it in the wrong place and she's giving me a stroke. Okay. So I, they let me in and it turns out that the only way to get into the interior part of this building is through other people's apartments. So I am wandering through a labyrinth of doilies and cat pictures uh, while these very kind women are gently patting me and I'm sitting there like, I am patient zero, I'm gonna kill this entire complex, I'm trying not to breathe. I thought we all agreed we weren't touching things. And they did not get that message. So I kind of get to her door and I have the groceries in hand and I'm like, I, I can hear her, I, that, I know that door exists. So, you know, we knock on the door and Margaret comes out and she has, she does not look like the grandmother I envisioned, which is fine, but like none of my like visions were coming true. So this was yet another disappointment. She had like long white hair and just like an angry expression on her face. And she said, I know you think you're trying to help, but nobody ever listens to me. I give really explicit directions and you didn't listen. And I was like, Margaret, I'm so sorry. I can just give you the groceries now. And she's like, yes, I'll take them. And then she slams the door. And the other three women are so kind and they're just patting me and I'm still like, oh no. And then they, I walk back through the labyrinth of dollies and doilies and cat pictures. And one of them hands me a cookie, an oatmeal cookie. And I was like, oh, I don't know if we're supposed to like really be sharing food especially like unwrapped and they're like oh no 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 you worked so hard you should really take this cookie and I was like ah death cookie um so I take the death cookie 
and I put it in my pocket. And when I put it in my pocket, I feel like something's not in my pocket. What is happening? I've lost my wallet. So I get to the middle of Waltham on the commons and I'm like, no shame at all, just sitting on the bench crying. Like, I was trying to fix a thing. I tried to help. Look at what it got me. This is terrible. I wanted to build community. I just made an enemy. Um, and my sister's on the phone with me and she's like, you need to like take a deep breath. And I was like, I've been breathing. Um, and then all of a sudden my phone buzzed and I had an Instagram direct message notification. Those are generally not great. It's generally from men that I did not ask anything of or for or from, and it's never pleasant. And I was like, this is the last thing I need. I don't want to have some stupid person say something mean to me. And, but I opened it and it said, hi, I'm a bank teller at Rockland Trust. And I found your wallet and I looked you up and if you want to go and get it, it's at Rockland Trust. And I was like, what? I like run over and I'm like s s snotty and crying and I'm, I'm sure I looked amazing guys. So I get there and the teller, a woman teller is there. I was like, I think you have my wallet. And she was like, oh yes, I think we do. Can you just confirm with your name and date? And I do all of that and I am the, I'm me. So I get my wallet and I just, I'm so filled with adrenaline that even though the problem is done, I'm still upset. And I just, I'm carrying this wallet and I, and I get to my house, and my cat sits on my lap, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I kind of have this idea that like, oh, you don't have to like a person to help a person. And liking a person and helping a person doesn't make the world better or not. And I feel so strongly that this was a sign that I should continue, and it's been about two and a half years of mayhem and mishaps, and also beautiful community building, I mean, the resources we have in Waltham and the people I've met through the work that I've been trying to do have really enriched my life, and I have to thank Margaret. Thank you, Rachel. She didn't need the death cookie, guys. It's all okay. It all ended well. Um, so we are up to our last teller of the night. And then after that, don't run away, because there is an open mic and there are some slips in the hat. Harry Lacoste. Hey. Harry is an there. early education teacher. And I'm not misspeaking. He is a puppeteer. His puppet friend is called Gus. You should check out gusesyellow.com. No, uh, Gu Gus is uh, Good News Gus. Good News Gus, that's right. He's awesome. Uh, Harry is a comedian and a twin. And his credits include wrangling kids on the show Sesame Street. Sure. And um, his story today is comes with a bit of a trigger warning. He does speak of infertility. But here we go. Take it away, Harry. Give me a second. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Harry. And I am married <laughs> to the lovely Becca. And we have been married for almost nine years in a row. And uh, <laughs> we met in New York City. And we were excited. And we bonded over baseball and beer and talking about babies and family and how important it was to us. And if it all worked out, who knows, you know? And then after some beer, you know, we were in the corner making googly eyes and making up baby names, and who knows? And uh, when I finally got my head out of my butt, I proposed, and we got married. And uh, yeah, and we were like, hey, we're, we should start a family. And we were like, let's get out of New York before we start a family. Uh, and uh, we wanted to move back home to Massachusetts. Now, I, I grew up in Weymouth, and she grew up outside of Worcester. And we were like, well, where can we be close to our family, you know, but not too close. <laughs> and so we were like, and we found Waltham. And my wife got a job, and she works at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall School. And I came to Waltham, and I got a job eventually. And I uh, 
I, um, I, I worked all over Boston, Cambridge, and, and, and some of the burbs, and I, I got to work, and we were getting to work, and we were like, let's start a family. So we did. Uh, we tried. Uh, and we, we tried to start a family, and that was really fun. But um, we were never quite successful in making a child. And so we went to the doctor. They have wonderful doctors here in Massachusetts. And because we moved back to Massachusetts, they have wonderful opportunities. And so we looked at fertility treatment. Inf not fertility. Yeah, fertility treatment. I almost said infidelity. Um, that's a whole different show. <laughs> <sighs> but the doctor said, let's try this, try that, try this. And we had some setbacks. And we, I tried to, I lost a little weight. <clears throat> Figured maybe that'll help. And then I found it. And, um, we, we tried uh, ICSI, and we tried hormones, and we tr it was just a long process, and it takes the fun out of the fun part. And timed intercourse and shots. I had to give shots into my wife's cute butt and turn it purple with all the bruises and all the chemicals. We had to like rush into her body so her chemical levels were higher and lower and making sure we had the right time and blood tests. And then we had to make sure that her blood was tested and then wait till the test come back and then wait and then we're just waiting and we're good. No, we're waiting again. And then we take more tests and we're waiting. And then we tried IVF and we went through this after months and months and months and we were like, okay, let's try the biggest science experiment we can do with and so they painfully removed eggs from my wife's belly and awkwardly took my sample and in a petri dish in a lab and stuff they made fertilized eggs that they moved to my wife's body and then we wait to make sure that it adheres to the sides of the insides of her guts and then makes a baby and so we had a lot of buildup and a lot of weight and a lot of weight. And then we took tests on Saturday and they said, call tomorrow. I said, okay, great. We're going to see the family. Maybe we'll have good news. Here we go. And we, we, we called on Sunday. <laughs> and uh, they said it didn't happen, which is fine. We were like, what are the chances? It's the first time, you know. But it just stung because it was Mother's Day. And we wanted to tell our family the good news, you know. And so we told our mothers. And then we tried again because we really wanted to have this family. And uh, hurry up and wait and go. And, oh, is that on the... and so we tried again and we tried again. And then we were sitting in our apartment over by Brandeis. We rented an apartment and... Um, we had this ugly little floral couch, and we're sitting on it, and we have to call and get more results. And she's got the phone on speaker, and her blood level count has got to be above 10. And the woman on the phone says, it's 800. And I was like, first of all, why the pause because that was really tough to hear but then I was just like in disbelief like 800 how could the scale be 10 but it didn't make sense and she's like wait it's real you know it's happening and so 800 means she's got like I was what is there 12 babies in there I'm like I don't understand why and I'm a twin I'm like hey we got a winner I don't know instant family but it didn't it didn't we had we had we had a baby in her belly and and, and the baby grew in her belly and she got so cute and chubby and then the baby got here and we have we have a baby we have a baby boy <laughs> and we didn't tell my we didn't we didn't find out what kind of baby we were gonna have there's so few surprises nowadays that we thought let's not find out and that drove our parents crazy and that was still a little fun too and so they held up the baby, and I was like, it's a good, wait a minute, that's, that's a boy. And so we were so shocked that we, we have a boy, and his name is Angus. And uh, he's, he's remarkable. And we have a child, and we, we thought, well, we still want more family. You know, we wanted to have a boy, and maybe a girl, maybe another boy, just another kid. We wanted to have a bigger family, because we had this long list of names. And we were like, well, we got, you know, if we have twins, we have two boys, we got these two. And if no, that doesn't match with this one, you know. 
And, and, and so we, we wanted to try again. After all, like everybody in our family, my, my, my sister, my twin sister and her husband have a girl and a boy. My brother and his wife have a, a boy and a girl. And my brother-in-law and his wife have a girl and a boy. And we were like, let's try. And then we thought, let's wait. With all the waiting from the doctors and the tests and all the things, let's try. And so we called the doctor and we said, okay, we, you know, Angus is about a year now. And we had his birthday party at the cafe in the Common, which was really nice. And it was just so wonderful to be back in Massachusetts where we were like, okay, it's going to be tumultuous, but let's try it again. You know, we're not getting any younger. And so we, doctor said, listen, you're going to have to wait. Shocker. And make sure she's ready. And when she has her next period, then we'll start. And so, you know, when she was 35, she had Angus. And the term geriatric, geriatric was thrown around. And I was like, I know, I know what you mean, doctor, but it sounds terrible. And I don't, you know, and they say more complications at the older ages. And I was like, you don't know my wife. And uh, she's a machine. She can do anything. She'll, and she can. And so we were, like, getting ready. And also taking care of a child and jobs. And I... I worked with children, and it was like so hard to like want this family and seeing all these kids have families and brothers and sisters and stuff, and I'm like, I, I'm a puppeteer, and I'm like, hello everybody, Hi. we want another kid, you know, and it's just, it was hard to, 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 to okay, here we go, we're going to get ready, we're going to start, wait for that period, which is such a frustrating thing, because for years we're like, we don't want that, we want the period, we want the period, we want the period, and then we're like, let's have a kid, and then there's periods, we're like, we don't want the period, now we have to wait for the period, and then not get the period, and then we, <sighs> so here we are, and it, it, it never, it never came for like weeks, and then a few months go by, and we're like, okay, well, you know what, to pass the time, we'll check in with the doctor, maybe something's wrong, who knows, and, and to pass the time, I, I bought back a, a, a box of, um, it's a mystery game, and we were sitting on our couch, we got a new couch, it's nice, <laughs> And uh, we're sitting on the couch, and I give her this gift. And she's like, I want you to sit down, because I have a gift for you, too. And, and we sit down, and I give her this mystery box. I'm like, every month a new box comes, and we can do this together, right? And she's like, yeah, cool, okay, great, put it on the floor. And then she hands me this box, and I'm like, okay, great. Hey, she went out. I didn't know. Okay, because then she opens it up, and I pull it out, and I'm like, it's a, it's a pregnancy test. And I'm like, why is she giving me Angus's pregnancy test? Because I don't have a... It took me so long to realize this was a new one and that we didn't need the doctor because we had a miracle. We had a natural baby growing in our belly. <sighs> this time we did find out what kind of baby we were going to have because we were like to find out the process here, you know. And so we popped a balloon, and we, we, we brought the balloons to It's a Party, and we're like, here's the doctor says this, you do this and put the, the pink one or the blue one, and we'll, you know, give us the thing. And I was like, bring that home just in case they don't do it the right way. Um, and, 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 and so we popped the balloon, and we saw the most beautiful explosion of pink. And so we had our baby girl, and we named her Vera. And we live here in Waltham, and if you see us around, please say hi. I'm Harry, this is Becca, and we'll probably be with our miracles. Happy Harry told Harry's my friend from the commuter rail. I've known him for a very long time, and Becca, and I'm just so pleased he shared that story with us. Uh, and that was our last teller, and I want to spend more time and think about all their stories. I'm sure you do too. So let me, um, first of all, do a round of thanks. Thank you to all the tellers for sharing stories which are not always easy to tell. You guys did an awesome job. I'm so, so proud of how you stepped up and made this dream that I had come true, and it's all thanks to you, everybody. So um, this is my last cue card for the evening. Thank you again. Thank you to the museum for having us in this beautiful space. It was so meaningful to have this link to Waltham history to share the first big show here. Um, 
A uh, few things, uh, please, if you enjoy the stories you saw today, please support us. Uh, follow the calendar of events for Charles River Museum. They, there's a wonderful lineup, including more of these shows, one every season, like Bob said. Um, all of you should have these little blue cards on your seats with the email for this show, which is very creatively called wearewaltham at gmail.com. Pretty easy to remember. If you have a story, please pitch it. I'm, I'm the one who will be sifting through them. I'm going to pick which stories we can have on a future show. If you know of someone who should be telling a story, they're a really good storyteller, please give them the email or connect me to them through the email. Um, I'm also having a lot of trouble reaching out to a lot of the minority communities in Waltham, especially the ones with language problems. So please help me. Let's try and get as many people from as many walks of life on this stage to tell us stories, take us into their lives, have us walk a mile in their shoes and just increase, broaden our horizons and show us that together we're all Waltham. There's no one Waltham, we're all of it. Um, good night and thank you very much. Stay healthy and keep telling stories. <laughs> <laughs>